Pokemon game is rigged to always give me the worst outcome possible. I will always miss my attacks. My opponents will always land a critical hit, dealing enormous damage, as well as a ton of other misfortunes that'll basically have me in constant pain. So, with the most unforgiving RNG imaginable, is it still possible to beat a Pokemon game? Well, let's find out. When choosing our starter, there is a wrong choice here, as one of them will lead to a guaranteed game over. So let me know who you're choosing in the comments below, but for me, I decided to take Lucky the Bulbasaur. However, immediately we're faced by our first hurdle, because Bulbasaur only has two moves, Growl, which does no damage, and Tackle, which usually has a tiny 5% chance to miss. However, with my rigged odds, it will always miss every single time. So our helpless Bulbasaur has no way of damaging anything and we just get crushed. This raises a huge problem. If we can't hit any other Pokemon, how do we level up our Bulbasaur? Well, you might think that we can just catch another Pokemon to use. Nope. With basic Pokeballs, even a low HP Pokemon will never have a true 100% catch rate. In fact, the odds will cap out at 99.94%. And you might be thinking, who would possibly fail these odds? That's right, this guy. Turns out, bad luck is a deadly disease affecting trillions, and the only way to protect yourself is to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Do your part, find the strength to click subscribe, or your family too will become just as unlucky as this man. Give generously and stay safe out there. So we can't catch any Pokemon and we can't damage any Pokemon either. This seems hopeless, but there is one way forward, struggle. See, the wild Metapod and Kakuna of the Viridian Forest only know one move, Harden, and it does no damage. So we can use these little guys to drain the power points of our useless moves without taking any damage. In one of the most thrilling series of battles of all time, where our Bulbasaur can't even hit a stationary cocoon, we eventually drain all of our PP. However, if at any time we run into a Pikachu, we'll be trapped since Bulbasaur is slower, meaning that with my bad luck, we have a 0% chance to escape and immediately lose. But by saving my game, if we do run into a terrifying Pikachu, I can reset my game to prevent us from wiping. Eventually, once we we have no PP left, Bulbasaur will use Struggle, a 50 power move which, importantly, has 100% accuracy. This lets us wail on the defenseless Kakuna, basically using our Bulbasaur as a struggling melee weapon. And while Struggle does deal recoil damage to Bulbasaur, in Gen 3 games, this is set to 25% of the damage we deal, rather than 25% of our total health like in later generations. This is key, as it means that we can outpace Kakuna, and with that, we had finally beaten our first Pokemon. And by repeating this process over and over again, we finally level up, reaching level 7, where Bulbasaur learns Leech Seed, another inaccurate move that we will never be able to use. However, at level 10, it gets Vine Whip, an accurate grass move that we can actually use. And this is our key to progressing through the Viridian Forest, where we encounter our first trainer battle. Our Bulbasaur may be a higher level, but since our opponents will always land a critical hit, while we are guaranteed to get the lowest damage rolls possible, we still can't even beat a pathetic Weedle with our Vine Whips. Thankfully though, Struggle does considerably more damage, allowing us to overcome our first real battle. After running the pockets of our first victim, we're clear to push onwards to Pewter City, where our first gym badge awaits. And you might be wondering why I don't just grind up Bulbasaur to an absurdly high level and sweep the game with Vine Whip. That's because I'm a sucker for pain. On top of the terrible rigged odds in this challenge, I'm also capped to the level of the next gym's ace. In addition, I can't use any items from the bag in battle, and I'm playing on set mode just to make this whole experience even more painful. With these rules in mind, it was time to tackle the first gym. And if you subscribe to the Charmander philosophy, sadly, this is where your run ends, because Metal Claw will never actually land, and your other moves have no hope of yielding a win. On the other hand, us Bulbasaur enjoyers are eating good here. Brock has a severe allergy to touching grass, so Bulbasaur can absolutely shred through his team with a string of quad effective vine whips. With Brock's onyx left in pieces, we had gotten our first badge. And while that that battle was straightforward, it's still a serious problem that we only have Bulbasaur. As proof of this, the first trainer on the very next route has three bug types that we need to deal with. Our pathetic, ineffective Vine Whips are not enough to get us through this fight, and once again, we are drowning in a sea of L's. 
<sighs> Back to grinding. Once again, I helplessly struggled against the cocoons of Viridian Forest, which really made me ponder the meaning of my existence and why I'm doing this to myself. But then Bulbasaur reached level 16 and evolved into Ivysaur. This gives us a huge power boost, and with our upgraded plant in full bloom, now we can struggle our way through the bug trainers of Route 3. It's a pathetic strategy, but it is effective, allowing us to safely move through Route 3 and into Mount Moon. Most of the trainers here are are completely skippable, with the exception of two. The first is a Rocket Grunt, who we can take care of with struggle. But the second is Super Nerd Miguel. This guy is a nightmare. Easily our toughest fight yet. Let me break this down for you. He has three Pokemon, two of which are poison types, meaning that my Vine Whip is pathetic. And so you might be thinking, Keegan, why not just use struggle? And the reason is his final Pokemon, Voltorb. Because even if we can make it all the way to this stupid Ball. Hitting it with Struggle activates its static ability, paralyzing Ivysaur, and having the worst luck possible means that my paralyzed Pokemon will never be able to move. Paralysis is literally a death sentence. So, Grass moves don't work, and neither does struggle. With the level cap in place, there is nothing we can do. But that didn't stop me from trying over and over again. However, I would lose every single time with no way out. And after our 35th consecutive loss, I realized that this fight was impossible. Our luck had run out. We had no choice but to sadly return to Pallet Town. At least, that's what I thought, until I had an idea. The first step is to backtrack through Mount Moon and pick up the TM for Bullet Seed. It's weaker than Vine Whip, but importantly, this move doesn't make contact, allowing us to sidestep the issue of Voltorb static. But that on its own isn't enough to conquer this nerd, because we're also relying on his Grimer. More specifically, one of its moves, Disable. In this challenge, Disable will lock me out from using my most recent move for the next five turns. And if that move is the only move with PP remaining, then I'll be forced to struggle for the next five turns. This gives us the best of both worlds. It means we can struggle against the poison types while disabled before being freed up to use Bullet Seed against Voltorb to avoid paralysis. In practice, this is still a horrible time, as we're reliant on Grimer using Disable and Harden enough times. If it takes Ivysaur to Pound Town more than once, the attempt basically dies there, as we won't have enough health to make it through coughing. However, eventually, our lucky Ivysaur is able to finish Grimer with enough health remaining. And once we're no longer disabled, Bullet Seeds are enough to finish Coughing too. While Bullet Seed is a pathetic move that will only ever hit twice, combine this with Bulbasaur's Overgrow ability, and this means that two Bullet Seeds are all we need to crush Voltorb. It took way too much effort, but we had finally beaten an insignificant early game NPC. Naturally, I took the Helix Fossil in hopes that RNGesus would finally bless us with even a crumb of luck. Spoiler, he did not. However, I can't even express just how huge of a milestone this is for our challenge, as just outside this cave, we can find ourselves a hidden Great Ball. This is our salvation and the key to opening up this game. Because while low HP and base Pokeballs will never have a 100% catch rate, Great Balls are a different story. And I know exactly how we're going to make use of this one singular Great Ball. First, we have to travel all the way back to Viridian Forest, because it's here that we can find the ketchup-loving mascot, Pikachu. If we can get a Pikachu to low health, a Great Ball will be enough to guarantee the catch. However, every single single one of our attacks will kill Pikachu instantly. Even struggle is too much for Pikachu to handle. So how do we weaken this thing? Well, at level 5, Pikachu has Growl, which will lower our attack. However, it also has Thundershock, which will always cause paralysis and render Ivysaur completely useless. Basically, I need it to use Growl twice in a row. And since level 5 Pikachus are really rare, this took an eternity. Stop paralyzing me! Thankfully, eventually we find a Growl Growling Pikachu, and with Ivysaur at minus two attack, a struggle is just enough to not kill. Meaning that with our one Great Ball, we can finally catch a Pokemon. I name it Pokachu, and this guy is about to open up the floodgates. Because at level eight, our lucky Pokachu learns 
Tiger Wave, a fully accurate status move that paralyzes our opponent. And while low HP Pokemon can't be caught with a base Pokeball, low HP Pokemon that are also paralyzed can be. So I went absolutely wild, catching a bunch of Pokemon. And this is huge, as after doing some switch training, now we've actually got some really good Pokemon. Our strongest being the Magikarp that we can buy from the Salesman, which evolves into Gyarados, as well as Nidoran, which evolves into Nidorina, before using a Moonstone from Mount Moon to evolve into Nidoqueen. My queen, you look beautiful. Now we're finally clear to enter Cerulean City, and you might be thinking, well, this game will be easy now that we've got some powerful Pokemon. Wrong. Because even with a full team, our rival is a nightmare. I was hoping to Thundershock his Pidgeotto, but Pikachu just gets rocked by a single quick attack. So I sent in our own Pidgeotto, and this may look like a fair fight, but these two birds are built very different, because our rival's Pidgeotto does enormous damage, while our bird is... Pathetic. My bird is broken. I want a new one. After our Pidgeotto is quickly slapped into its grave, Nido Queen takes point and can weaken the opposing bird with a few scratches. However, then we're hit by Sand Attack, a move that lowers my accuracy, meaning that I'll never land an attack. While we can reset the stat drop by switching, it does mean that Butterfree is basically sacrificed in the process. <laughs> Bye bye, Butterfree. But its sacrifice wasn't in vain, as it means that Nido Queen can come back out and get hit by another sand attack. Are you kidding me? This means we have to also sacrifice our Ivysaur, and this stupid bird has ripped through four of my Pokemon. Thankfully, Nido Queen just survives a gust before finally finishing the demonic Pidgeotto with Scratch. And the incoming Abra only knows teleport, making it free real estate for Nido Queen to scratch to death. The Rattata that follows quickly gets revenge on our Queen, meaning that now now we're left with only Go Fish the Gyarados. And if there's one universal truth in this world, it's that regardless of poor RNG, Gyarados is good. With two bites, we cleanly finish Rattata. This brings it down to a 1v1, but Gyarados can barely outpace Charmander, giving us a very clutch win. And while it feels so good to slap my rival around, just look at the imbalance between these teams. We should have steamrolled this battle, but instead we were fighting for our life. This made me terrified. How could we possibly deal with full teams of powerful Pokemon that are actually good? However, we have a much bigger problem lingering in our immediate future, because after cruising through the northern route up to Bill's house, we have to contend with Misty. And this fight is horrible. Her Stami is fast, strong, and its water pulses will always hit the small chance to confuse my Pokemon, which is a death sentence, because I'll never break out of confusion and proceed to to hit myself for all eternity. To make things even worse, under my rules, I can only bring two Pokemon to make this a fair 2v2 fight. You might think that a grass type and an electric type would crush the water gym, but that's where you're wrong. While I can reliably take out Staryu, the demonic Starmie that follows is a whole other beast, because a single water pulse drowns our Pikachu immediately, and two Swifts annihilate our Ivysaur. All three attempts ended in slaughter. It wasn't even close. I tried subbing in some other Pokemon like Gyarados and Beedrill, but ultimately, the result was the exact same as our losses continued piling up. But then I remembered something. See, back on Route 4, I picked up a person berry, a single-use berry that, when held by a Pokemon, will cure confusion. And this changes everything. With a new plan, I marched into Misty's gym, ready for revenge. This time, I lead with Ivysaur as a Vine Whip brings Staryu into the red. This forces Misty to burn her Super Potion before two more Vine Whips finish off her first Pokemon. Misty's main star then takes center stage. Since I'm a Grass type, Misty doesn't use Water Pulse, instead opting for Swift that puts me at low HP. However, this this is perfect, as now my overgrow ability activates, supercharging my next grass attack as Vine Whip does big damage. But Ivysaur falls on the following turn, bringing it down to a 1v1. Starmie versus Beedrill. Starmie outspeeds, firing off a deadly water pulse and... Beedrill just survives! Despite being confused, our person berry cures this immediately, clearing our Beedrill to land a super effective twin needle, finishing off the deadly starfish once and for all. That was our hardest fight yet, and now we had our second badge. However, the final boss of the early game was still to come. For now though, we're bound for Vermilion City, and on the next few routes, we can get some really useful items like the Dig TM, a Citrus Berry, and another Great Ball. At this point in the game, we've also 
also got access to two NPC trades. And this is important because while my Pokemon have the worst stats possible with zero IVs across the board, the IVs of Pokemon in NPC trades are hard coded into the game, meaning there's no room for bad RNG. And since we now have access to two NPC trades, I'm able to get my hands on a Farfetch'd and a Nidoran. And while Farfetch'd is still not that great, Nidoran is a different story because after evolving Miss Nido into Nido Queen, this one has way better stats than our current Queen. So I'm fully investing into our new Nido Queen, teaching it Body Slam at level 22, as well as giving it my Dig TM. This is a huge upgrade for our team. And speaking of upgrades, you can upgrade your game collection with our sponsor, AFK Journey. AFK Journey is a brand new ethereal fantasy RPG. In AFK Journey, you'll play as Merlin and embark on a fantasy quest through a gorgeously designed world. It's different from AFK Arena, it's not just an idle game. After creating your unique custom character, you'll explore big, diverse maps, meet new characters, and solve fun puzzles. On top of that, you'll gradually gather new heroes from across six factions and experiment with which heroes work best together in battle, as well as what formation to assemble them in, giving the game a lot of strategic depth. In AFK Journey, your resources will grow while you sleep, your heroes level up together, and equipment is shared within classes, meaning the game is beginner friendly and has minimal grinding. So to start playing for free, click my link in the description to download AFK Journey on mobile or PC. During the official release, over 40 heroes are being given away for free, including epics. Additionally, you'll receive over 200 free draws by just progressing through the game and completing events like seven day logins. And for an extra boost, use the CD key AFK Journey 88 to redeem these bonuses to help kickstart your new adventure with AFK Journey. After reaching Vermilion City, we quickly move onto the SSN, where I raid the kitchen trash cans like a ravenous raccoon looking for its next meal. Also waiting for us here is our rival. And while our last encounter was insanely close, this time things would be different because Miss Nido went absolutely wild, soloing this man's whole team with a powerful string of body slams and digs. This was an absolute beatdown. Can I get a little respect for our new queen? Show your support right now by typing being thanks Miss Nido in the comments. Do your part. Anyway, after negotiating with the ship captain, we secure the cut HM and this clears us to take on the Vermilion Gym. However, this place is hell. Surge's team is the cheesiest RNG cocktail that we've come across yet. Basically, there are two huge problems here. First, all of his Pokemon have static, meaning that if you touch them, you'll be paralyzed and never move again. On top of that, two of his Pokemon know double team, and this is even worse. Because if Surge boosts his evasion even a single time, I will never be able to land an attack. With all these lingering threats, this fight is a nightmare. I tried over and over. Of course, I lost every single time without fail. But then I had an idea. See, a Pokemon can only have one status effect at a time, meaning that if my Pokemon are already poisoned, they can't also be paralyzed. So I pre-poison my Pokemon in battles against wild Pokemon, which also has the added effect of boosting Raticate's attack thanks to its guts ability. With the problem of paralysis now dealt with, I faced up to Surge, ready to establish our dominance. Immediately, this plan pays dividends ends as a single secret power from Raticate brings Voltorb into the red. This forces Surge to burn his potion before our rat quickly finishes the job. Next up is his Pikachu, but we outspeed and immediately take it down with one shot. Now it's down to a 3v1. We just need to pray that Raichu doesn't use... Double Team. Ah. Now none of my attacks will ever land, and we're just forced to sit there as this chubby yellow oaf picks apart my entire team. We were so close, but all it took was a single double team to decimate my roster. I tried again and again, but this Raichu would always double team without fail. This fight sucks so much. Quickly, it became very apparent that we'd need to solve the evasion problem too if we wanted any hope of winning this fight. So I basically need to find a move 
move that can't miss. Thankfully, by cutting our way onto Route 9, east of Cerulean, we can find Aerial Ace. This attack ignores accuracy, meaning it will deal damage regardless of my opponent's evasion. I need to teach it to a ground-type Pokemon so that I'll be immune to Raichu's deadly shockwave. And while Nidoqueen makes for a solid candidate, unfortunately, that won't work. Aerial Ace makes contact with the enemy and will trigger Raichu's static ability. And since Nidoqueen's a poison type, she can't be pre-poisoned to sidestep paralysis. So instead, I hunt for a Sand Shrew as this little guy can learn Aerial Ace. While we can't paralyze it with Thunder Wave, we can guarantee the catch with a Great Ball at low HP. I bestow it the name Surge Protector, and once our new team member reaches level 22, it evolves into a spiky Sand Slash. Now, our improved team is ready for Surge. So after pre-poisoning my Pokemon again, we return to the gym in search of vengeance. Just like last time, Raticate can drain Surge's potion before quickly finishing both Voltorb and Pikachu with secret power. Once again, Surge was down to only his Raichu. This time, I have Raticate land a quick attack for some important chip damage before falling. Our Pidgeotto in the back does the exact same thing before immediately being taken down. Now we're down to only our Sand Slash in a tense 1v1. As is tradition, Raichu uses Double Team, which is exactly what I was hoping for. Aerial Ace still connects despite barely doing any damage. Another one on the next turn has Raichu on the brink of death. And after we barely survive one more quick attack, one last Aerial Ace finishes Raichu, and we have finally conquered Lieutenant Surge. Our rigged RNG made that fight insanely tough, but now we have our third badge. This is a significant point of the challenge too, as now the map really opens up, and our first stop is the Rock Tunnel, where most of the battles are relatively straightforward, at least until I had the misfortune of stepping into the dreaded realm of Hiker Dudley. This man is a pest. His stupid pet rocks will always roll magnitude 10 critical hits, which cripple my team. His Graveler then goes wild, firing off some supercharged rock slides, which utterly pummeled every single remaining Pokemon of my team. Once again, we had lost. The danger in this challenge is everywhere, not just the gym leaders. As proof of this, once we return to the hiker and have Ivysaur whip him into submission, we can finally exit the rock tunnel where we reach Lavender Town. And it's here in the Pokemon Tower that we're reunited with our rival. We may have beaten him easily last time, but now his team is even stronger. And straight away, this went so, so badly. Because while you would think that our Pikachu has the edge over Pidgeotto, in reality, we just get slapped by a single quick attack. Okay, great start. While Miss Nido is able to issue some swift revenge, this brings out our next problem, eggs. These yoke folk are a problem since Hypnosis will always land and my Pokemon will never wake up. Basically, it's a death sentence that quickly sees Miss Nido fall before our almighty Gyarados also succumbs to the unforgiving wrath of a half dozen eggs. Our team was already starting to fall apart. To add insult to injury, Kadabra confused my beloved Pidgeotto, forcing the bird to punch itself to death. And once Gyarados emerged, our fate was sealed. As a string of critical hit thrashers, absolutely annihilates my two remaining Pokemon. We lost again. Clearly, we needed to get serious if we wanted any hope of beating this game. Our opponents are only going to get stronger and we need to keep up. So for now, I left Lavender Town behind and headed west through the underground path and onwards to Celadon City. And by grabbing the tea from this lady in Celadon, we can share it with the guards to also grant us access to Saffron City. Now the map was really opened up and with that comes the ability to upgrade our team through things like buying TMs, as well as Great Balls. But even more important than that, now we can buy Evolution Stones. And this is huge, because once Pikachu reaches level 26 and learns Thunderbolt, we can use our newly purchased Thunderstone to evolve our Puny Mouse into a slightly less Puny Mouse, Raichu. With this huge boost in power, we return to our rival in the Lavender Tower. And this time, things would be different, as Raichu Thunderbolted Pidgeotto out of the sky, as well as as the Gyarados that followed. We were cruising. However, nothing could prepare me for the nightmare that was about to emerge. Eggs part two. Immediately, our Pidgeotto is put into an eternal slumber that it will never wake up from. And while Gyarados does land a bite, it too is put to bed before Execute devastatingly also hits us with a Leech Seed. 
This means it can recover back all of the damage that we actually did manage to deal. This is the egg's world, and we're just living in it. Because this demon then proceeded to slaughter not one, not two, but three more of my Pokemon with its stupid sleep and confusion RNG cheese. I hate this thing with a burning passion. Despite Raichu finally finishing off Execute, we were far too deep in the hole now, as Kadabra quickly finished off our final Pokemon. This challenge is absolutely destroying my mind, but I'm not ready to give up yet. So I stepped up to face our rival again. On this attempt, Raichu quickly KOs our rival's first two Pokemon. However, this time, once the eggs emerge, I just land a Thunderbolt, sacrificing Raichu in the process. And at this range, a super effective fight from Miss Nido scrambles those eggs into their Yoki grave. From here, the rest of the fight is straightforward, with Pidgeotto quick attacking its way through Kadabra, before one last dig from Miss Nido buries Charmeleon. We have finally gotten through that hellish fight, and I hope that I never see those cursed eggs ever again. With that trauma behind us, I headed back to Celadon and tried to win some money at the game corner. But the odds are so stacked against us that we can't win anything. This is so sad. Only you can restore my good luck by leaving a like on this video right now. Please, give generously. Mum, I need you to remortgage the house. I guarantee that I can double the money in five minutes. You're going to the casino again, aren't you? Maybe. Despite our poor luck, deteriorating relationships, and severe gambling debts, the next section of our challenge is smooth sailing as we brute force our way through the Team Rocket Celadon hideout before barely beating Giovanni's nightmarish Kangaskhan, securing us the Sylph Scope, which we'll need to clear the Lavender Tower. But for now, we have another gym standing in our way. The last two have been nightmares to deal with, so I was horrified about what was to come. Erica's team thrives on inflicting status effects as well as spamming Giga Drain for HP recovery. But this should be simple, right? We can just assemble some flying types and pre-poison our Pokemon to protect us from status effects. Or so I thought, because despite having the type advantage, Erica's Victory Bell does enormous damage with Acid, while my super effective Peck does... Pathetic damage. Farfetch'd immediately falls on the following turn. This bird is useless. Now I know why that trainer was so willing to just give it away. Our Pidgeotto fares somewhat better, bringing Victory Bell to the brink of death with Wing Attack. However, it too succumbs to the all-powerful plant. Basically, this is what is happening to me right now. So it was all down to our guts, Radicate. And thankfully, with a second secret power, we can finally finish Victory Bell. But Erica follows up with a menacing, tangled ball of spaghetti that Raticate stands no chance against. Giga Drains quickly sap our HP dry, and yep, once again, we suck. I am so tired of losing to these gym leaders. Clearly, I needed a new approach to conquer this gym, and I had just the idea. So I headed over to Route 7, and it's here that we can find... Volpix. After quickly catching the cute fox, I name it Arsonist because Volpix is about to start some fires in Celadon City. As once our Volpix reaches level 29, it learns Flamethrower, a fully accurate, insanely powerful fire type move. But we're not done yet because by gently using a Firestone on our Volpix, it evolves into an adorable looking Ninetales. And this is our key to victory in the next gym. The combination of Ninetales' impressive special attack stat married with its powerful flame thrower gives us a grass type scorching specialist. Um, just curious, but do your fire extinguishers work? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Perfect. This time, Erica's victory bell is burned alive in a sea of flames as a single flamethrower takes it down, and the tangler that follows is also quickly burned to a crisp in one shot. This leaves Erica with only her vile plume, who surprisingly does survive a flamethrower before crippling nine tails with stun spore. However, we can safely switch into Pidgeotto, who finishes the fight with one last wing attack. That's our fourth badge, and it feels like we've really come a long way. From being crushed by Misty and Surge, to now conquering Erica, on just our second try. We had some real momentum, and this was set to continue as we quickly ascended the Lavender Tower, using our Silk Scope to exercise the demon Marowak lurking beneath the summit. I just wish we could also exercise my gambling demons and bad luck too. After reaching Mr. Fuji at the top of Lavender Tower, we're given the Poke Flute, and this is our key to removing the big Snorlax roadblock standing in our 
way, and I desperately want to catch this big beefy boy, since Snorlax is such an amazing Pokemon. However, that's not possible, because even at 1 HP and asleep, Snorlax will never be a guaranteed catch, even with an Ultra Ball. So, sadly, we have no choice but to KO the Snorlax and let go of our hopes of ever owning one. Despite the disappointment, our consolation prize is using the item finder to dig up a leftovers from underneath Snorlax's corpse. With the gluttonous roadblock forcibly removed, now we're clear to move south down the bike path and into Fuchsia City. This city is home to one of the worst places in the entire game, the Safari Zone. This place is a scam. For $500, I get to throw Safari Balls that will never work, pick up a Quick Claw, which will never activate, and grab a Double Team TM that's about as useful as a Charmander in Brock's gym. I hate this place. Did you catch your fair share? I want my money back. Despite being scammed, we can get some amazing items here, like the HMs for Surf and Strength, two powerful, fully accurate moves. On top of that, it's here that we can also get the good rod. And you might be thinking, Keegan, who cares about a stupid fishing rod? But this rod is a godsend because this is our ticket to fishing up one of the best Pokemon possible for this challenge, Krabby. This little Krabby Patty is so important, like an angel who descended from the heavens to lift us from suffering. And the reason it's so important is Shell Armor. Krabby's ability that completely blocks critical hits. Since my Pokemon are usually crit every turn, effectively, this means that Krabby takes half the damage when compared to the rest of my Pokemon. And once Krabby evolves into Kingla at level 28, now we have a real powerhouse on our team. Since the next two gyms have the exact same level cap, I decided to clear out the rocket infestation in the Silco building first, before taking on both gyms back to back. Most of the battles here are relatively straightforward. That is, until we encounter our rival once again. The last time we battled, he scrambled my entire team with his egg, but I was determined for this time to be different. So I made sure to power up my team by evolving both our Ivysaur and Pidgeotto into their final forms. And with our upgraded roster assembled, we confidently stepped up to face our rival and... We still lost? Okay, it turns out I was a little under level, but that's not a mistake I'm making again. On the second attempt, I open with our Pokachu as a quick attack from Pidgeot immediately does a huge chunk of damage. However, our Thunderbolt hits the Pigeon harder, bringing it to the brink of death as a quick attack of our own on the next turn finishes the job. Our rival sends in Gyarados next, which has to be one of the tiniest brain, most negative IQ plays I've ever witnessed as a quad effective Thunderbolt instantly fries its brain into jelly. But then the dreaded eggs emerge. In all their Yoki fury, I switch into Nidoqueen, and in a classic egg move, the eggs paralyze Miss Nido, allowing them to quickly claim the kill. However, I won't let Execute haunt me anymore, because this time, I came prepared. This time, I brought my trusty flamethrower. In just a single shot, our arson fox fries those eggs into their grave. And once Ninetales also takes care of Alakazam, our rival was down to only his newly evolved Charizard. And I was feeling great. I mean, we still have five Pokemon left. However, Charizard is no easy foe because this wannabe dragon proceeded to destroy my Ninetales. And while Raichu can bring it to low health with a Thunderbolt, our Pokachu also falls in the process. Kingla puts up very little resistance before Venusaur is quickly burnt to a crisp by Flamethrower. What started as a comfortable 5v1 has quickly deteriorated into a deadly 1v1. But with Charizard at such low health, thankfully, a a single quick attack from Pidgeot can just finish off Charizard. We barely scraped by with the win. Even with our fully evolved team, this challenge is still pushing us right to the limit. And as a reward for beating our rival, we're given a Lapras by the Silph Co. employees. It's a very intelligent Pokemon. Uh, are you sure about that? And while I didn't realize it at the time, this Lapras is going to be a game changer. Because just like King Long, our Lapras has the Shell Armor ability, which is incredible for this challenge. At the top of the Sylph building, we have to take on Giovanni, and despite his Nido Queen giving us some trouble, ultimately, this is a clean fight, and we pick up the win on our very first attempt. Thank you for saving us. Because I am rich, I can give you anything. Okay, can you give me some good RNG?
Anything except that. Oh. After taking our consolation prize of a Master Ball, now it was time to take on the next two gyms back to back, and both of these are difficult for very different reasons. First up is Koga, and his team is packed to the brim with toxicity. He's got Pokemon that can blow up, smoke screen, and minimize for cheesy evasion strats, as well as a muck that has one of the filthiest, most disgusting movesets I've seen in this entire challenge. Earlier in the run, this team would have been impossible to defeat, but now. I had just the plan in mind. With my big, unlucky brain firing on all cylinders, I assembled my team and charged into Koga's gym, ready for a fight. Against this coughing, I lead with Nido Queen. Since Miss Nido is a poison type, we can't be poisoned. I was hoping that this would bait Koga into exploding, while I hide underground with Dig, but he just opts for Sludge, so instead, Nido Queen just spams Surf until the first coughing falls. And this is where the cheesiest pile of Sludge, Muck, emerges. Straight away, this coward uses Minimize. In the past, we've really struggled to deal with Pokemon boosting their evasion, but now I have a new plan, because our new Lapras knows the move Perish Song, and this will always land regardless of accuracy. When it does, all the Pokemon on the field faint in three turns. This forces Koga to switch out before the three turns expire, causing Muck to lose its stat boosts. With this strategy, the second coughing falls just as easy as the first. Then, another Perish Song on to the returning Muck forces the switch into Weezing, who is more of a threat than the coughing, but Miss Nido still gets the job done with a barrage of Surfs. This leaves Koga with only his Muck, and our win is all but guaranteed, as one final dig from Miss Nido buries the toxic pile of sludge six feet under. That's our fifth badge secured, and that win feels so good. Koga's team would have been an absolute run ender earlier in the challenge, but now we've got the tools and knowledge to overcome the hurdles that haunted us previously. And speaking of being haunted, next up is Sabrina. Where Koga likes to cheese you with poison and evasion stall, Sabrina is much more focused on inflicting confusion and overpowering you with the raw damage output of Alakazam. However, we have some powerful Pokemon too, so I assembled my best roster and stepped up for a showdown with Sabrina. Psychic types are generally pretty frail. This, combined with a pre-poisoned Raticate to activate its guts ability, means that a single secret power is enough to wipe Kadabra off the map. This brings in Ash Ketchum's stepdad, and a secret power just falls short of getting the KO this time. But this works out perfectly as Sabrina burns through both of her hyper potions by keeping Mr. Mime on life support as she desperately tries to stop him from fainting. Despite Sabrina's best efforts, once she runs out of potions, Mr. Mime eventually falls. Against the incoming Venomoth, I switch into Beedrill, whose job here is basically just to die. Sorry, Beedrill. But it's this sacrifice that clears nine tails to pull up and utterly incinerate Venomoth with a single flamethrower. Like a moth to a flame, the bug is burnt up, leaving Sabrina with only her Alakazam. Now it's a 3v1, but this thing is scary. Alakazam is absolutely capable of sweeping my entire team. It's faster than me, and its critical hit psychics are so deadly. However, Alakazam is frail, and all three of my remaining Pokemon have Quick Attack, a plus one priority physical move. This means that my Pokemon move first as we begin chipping away with Quick Attack. It only takes a single Psychic to demolish Ninetales, and while Pidgeot just pushes Alakazam into the red, it too is mind crushed by the overwhelming might of Alakazam. But thankfully, we still have Dear Rat Boy in the back. One final quick attack sends both Alakazam and his Spoon Collection straight to the Shadow Realm, finishing the fight and earning us badge number six. Those two gym fights show just how far our team has come in this challenge. Whether it be status effect spammers or powerful hard hitters, we've now got some answer for dealing with them. Despite that, the hardest battles in Kanto are still to come. The Pokemon League is on a whole other level. A gauntlet of powerful trainers with the strongest Pokemon in all of Kanto. Blaine is a simple man. He has a shiny, bald head, and four fire types that don't really have any tricks. So this makes it completely free real estate for our Lapras, who is immune to critical hits, to sweep through his entire team with a series of serves. It was a very clean solo wipe. That was actually pathetic, Blaine. All these fire types, and you still managed to bring zero heat. Pathetic.
Bill Steen invites us to his island, but this gives me some real Stranger Danger vibes, so we hit him with a fat rejection before backtracking to Viridian City for the final gym. And you know what? Maybe Giovanni's changed. Maybe he's reformed now. Maybe he's a new man and... <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. Regardless, this Giovanni fight is totally free. His ground types are slow, and we have a strong arsenal of water and grass Pokemon to deal big damage. In another dominant display, Lapras surfs all over Giovanni to hand him yet another L, meaning that we have somehow managed to obtain all eight gym badges with the worst luck possible. And while our last few gym battles were straightforward, this is the end game where the challenge is at its hardest. And if you don't believe me, well, as soon as we leave Viridian City, we encounter our rival. And let me tell you, I got destroyed. His Pokemon are just so strong and deal so much damage. A high roll, critical hit psychic from his Alakazam just destroys anyone on my team. And Charizard is an absolute beast who rips the rest of my team to shreds. Once again, we were handed yet another loss. Just as we had built up some momentum, we're immediately brought back down to reality with another loss. Although that doesn't stop us from moving through Victory Road, as after a long trek, we finally reach the Pokemon League. And this place horrifies me. Ahead of us lies some of the toughest battles in the entire game. Lorelei will freeze you, Agatha will double team cheese you, Lance will crit his hyper beams, the champion will simply overpower you, and Bruno will be there too. Against these heavy hitters, with the worst RNG imaginable on my side, this felt like such an impossible hurdle. But I had to try. So, armed with my trusted team of Pokemon, I stepped into the Pokemon League, and it was a bloodbath. My Pokemon got decimated. While I could scratch and claw my way through the first two fights, Agatha was just too tough. The rigged chaos of sleep, confusion, and double team was just way too much for my team to handle. And very quickly, we were utterly annihilated in three straight losses. We were battered, bruised, and down bad. Despite my best efforts, it was clear that my current team just wasn't going to cut it. So I had one option. I needed to build a new team consisting of the best, the fastest, and the strongest Pokemon I could find. It was time to assemble the God Squad. First up, is Snorlax. We couldn't catch it last time, but now we've got a Master Ball to conscript the giant oath into our squad. Next, after grabbing the Super Rod from this fisherman in Vermilion City, we can fish up Staryu. With a Water Stone evolving it into Starmie, the Pokemon that haunted us in the beginning of this challenge was now working for us. Our next member arrives after collecting the EV from Celadon City, slapping a Thunderstone on that bad boy, and evolving it into a sparky little Jolteon. Member number four is then resurrected from the dead as the Amber Fossil is revived into a Raging Aerodactyl. The last two slots are reserved for our existing Pokemon, Lapras, the Absolute Behemoth, as well as Beedrill, because I like Beedrill. So, after EV training our new team and upgrading their movesets, I had created the strongest team I could. I am so tired of losing in this challenge. And with this team assembled, it was time to decimate the Pokemon League and show just how strong we really are, even with the worst RNG possible. First up is Lorelei's water types, and I'm about to unleash our sparky new Jolteon. Even with the worst stats and lowest damage rolls possible, a single Thunderbolt still rips through her Dugong, Cloyster, and Slurp. Low bro. While Lapras does put up some resistance, its surf isn't powerful enough to KO Jolteon in one shot, causing the Loch Ness monster to eventually fall to a slew of high voltage Thunderbolts. The Jinx that follows does pick up one measly KO before an Earthquake from Aerodactyl finishes the job, taking down the first member of the Pokemon League. Next is Bruno, and as a fighting and rock type trainer, Bruno's two biggest weaknesses are Water and Psychic. And hey, what do you know? I've got just the thing for that. Starmie is a blessing for this challenge, with a cracked special attack stat and a ridiculously powerful moveset. A single surf is all we need to drown out both of Bruno's Onyx, with his fighting types each having their minds crushed with a single psychic. Bruno was decimated, and Patrick Starmie had claimed a clean sweep. 
But our star wasn't done yet, because Agatha's poison types also have a crippling weakness to Psychic, making it completely free for our Lucid star to spin all over her pathetic team in no time at all. That brings us to Lance, no doubt our toughest battle of the Pokemon League so far. His lead Gyarados is quickly shocked into submission by a quad effective Thunderbolt. Lance then follows up with his first Dragonair, so I hit him with the ultimate BM by sending in your mom the Snorlax. Lax tanks outrages pretty well thanks to its bulk before a second body slam squashes that snake. Our beefy Snorlax falls, but this clears the way for Starmie as a single Ice Beam crushes the second Dragonair before another one turns the giant Dragonite into a Popsicle. This leaves only Aerodactyl, who succumbs to a single Surf, meaning we had now conquered the final member of the Elite Four. And now, only the champion remained. Our rival, a man who has been a pain to deal with at every turn in this challenge. But now, we have our strongest team. It was time to see if we could conquer the final hurdle of this game with every piece of RNG stacked against us. As is tradition, he leads with Pidgeot, but now we've got an electrified Jolteon who immediately shoots it out of the sky with Thunderbolt. This baits in Rhydon, and I know that an Earthquake is coming, so bring in Aerodactyl who is immune. I fire off an Earthquake of my own, but it's not not enough as a single rock tomb extincts Aerodactyl for the second time. But Patrick Starmie quickly exacts revenge as Surf drowns out Rhydon and the Gyarados that follows is immediately crushed by Thunderbolt. While the fight felt like it was going smoothly, this is where the devil himself emerges. Exeggutor. The eggs are back in their final form, ready to ruin my day yet again. But I'm pulling no punches, immediately firing off an Ice Beam and... It just falls short. In typical egg fashion, Exeggutor puts Starmie to bed with sleep powder, and this is where the fight begins to spiral. At least, that's what I would say, if not for the fact that Starmie is holding a Lumberry, waking it up immediately. This allows Starmie to continue firing Ice Beams. All restores from our rival only serve to delay the inevitable, as eventually, the eggs are frozen into oblivion, never to be seen ever again. And from here, the rest of the fight is clean, with your mum the Snorlax conquering Alakazam, before a string of surfs from Lapras drown out Charizard. With that, we had beaten the most unfair Pokemon game possible. Jump into this video video next for more Pokemon content. Subscribe to the channel to improve your own RNG, and I'll see you in the next video.